today, um, I want to ask you to take a tone of seriousness because today I want to address some things in our church. Um, I believe that as a spiritual father or a spiritual parent or a spiritual leader, there are some things that sometimes pop up in our home and Crave Church is a home. And some of these things sometimes need to be addressed. And today I want to use this chapter to address some of the things that we are needing a little bit of investment in or pouring into and or even correction. Um, I want to start off by telling you and reminding you of our definition of worship. Worship is a continual outpouring of all that you are and all that you do. And what you prioritize is what you essentially worship. Um, today, we're going to be looking at this entire topic of prioritizing. Because what you prioritize, you seek after. You look for it. You are invested in. Because essentially, like I said, what you prioritize in your life is what you essentially worship. And Jesus spoke about this through a parable. And, you know, this parable, we, we, we hear it once in a while, once in a blue moon at church, and we don't really hear it again yet. I believe that the implications of this parable are super, super powerful and super strong. And it serves us as a warning. And I think that sometimes the most loving thing that you could ever do for someone is warn them of danger ahead. If there is something that is going to harm someone along the way or during or ahead of the path that they're walking in, I think it is unloving to not warn the people that are walking towards danger. And Jesus loves us so much that he taught us on specific things to warn us of the danger that was ahead. And this parable today that we're going to be looking at, this story, I think is a very, very strong warning for us as, as a church. So I want to get into this parable um, and remember that the whole context of today is that what you prioritize, you worship, because prioritizing is worship. What you seek is what you prioritize. What you invest your time in, that's what you prioritize. Because what you pour yourself out to is what you worship. And Jesus started this illustration, this parable, by saying, um, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. So the king in this moment, in this illustration, is God. The son represents Jesus. And then verse 3 says, when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. And the king's servants are the people that God sends to our lives so that we can receive an invitation to salvation. The king's servants represent the people that God sends to your life. And right now, in this illustration, in this parable, Jesus is going to distinguish three different types of people, three different groups of people. Here's how it starts, and here's the first group. But they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them. And I like that part because God sent, the king sends one group of servants to go and invite and they refused. And then this king was so merciful that he decides to send a second group of servants to go and invite them. So he sent other servants to tell them the feast has been prepared. The bulls and fattened cattle have been killed and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests he had invited, watch this, ignored the servants, ignored them, and went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business, and others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. This is the first group of Jesus' parable. This group of people are invited to the wedding, but they refuse the invitation to the wedding by giving a whole bunch of excuses to the servants. We can't make it. We have a farm to farm. We have a business to attend. And Jesus even says that some of the guests mocked and even killed the servants that the king had sent to invite them to this wedding for his son. It's so interesting that God will send people into your life and he sends them so that he could extend an invitation to salvation to receive the gospel. 
right now my life is represented as a servant that is inviting you to an invitation to have a relationship with Jesus through the gospel. God is so merciful that I'm not the only person that he's sending to your life right now through this quarantine season. There are possibly other people in your life that God has been sending, that God keeps on talk sending so that they can keep on talking to you about God, that they can keep on extending an invitation to the gospel. But what's interesting is that sometimes we mock the people that God sends our way. We insult them. And not only do we insult them, but we kill the relationships that are right for our life. And it's simply because we don't want to hear from God. We don't want to hear the invitation. And so this is the first group of people. These are the people that refuse God. They refuse the invitation. They are too busy. They offer up a bunch of excuses to not receive the invitation to salvation. These are the people that reject God. They don't want anything to do with Christ, with Jesus. Then Jesus continues and he tells the story and he keeps telling the story and he says, the king was furious and the king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready and the guests I have invited aren't worthy of the honor. So now go to the street corners and invite everyone that you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. This is the second group of people. These are the ones who receive the invitation and they gladly receive it with joy with faith. This represents every single person who hears the invitation of the gospel and they receive it and they genuinely have a relationship with Jesus. This represents the people that they hear the gospel message. They hear Jesus is wanting a relationship with them through church online or through a friend, through a city group, through a family member that's been praying for them. And they come to a point in their life where they say, okay, I'm going to receive Jesus. I'm going to open up my life. I may not be perfect. I may not be all there. I might not be all good, but I like how it included the good and the bad because Jesus's invitation is to everyone and you don't need to be perfect to come into a relationship with God. So this is the second group that Jesus is making. And then there's something completely unexpected. Jesus distinguishes a third group. And this third group is the craziest group, in my opinion. It's the most shocking one. Listen to how he says, but when the king came to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? And watch this, but the man had no reply. The man was like, Ugh, and no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is speaking this story. He's speaking this illustration. And this just this third part, this third group, this third person is just a mind blowing statement that Jesus decides to make. And he illustrates something that is so, so true and so powerful, yet it's so, so stealth. We don't see it all the time. We don't even know if this is us. The man without the proper clothes represents those who respond to God's call in a non saving way. This man responded to the call, but his improper clothes prove that he didn't belong at the wedding. See, the proper clothes for the wedding likely represent the gift of salvation freely offered in the gospel. And I really believe this man represents the people in the church who believe in God. They have an intellectual knowledge of who God is, but they offer lip service to God and their hearts are far far away they're in the church but they are not the church these are the people that are in the crowd they are in the church building they sing the songs to god they participate once a week and they go to church online right now during quarantine they know god intellectually theoretically but they don't know God in the heart. There is no real authentic relationship. They have not embraced Jesus for who he is. They just see Jesus as a good moralistic figure that has good sermons and teaches good things to do so that we can live a good life. But there is genuinely no salvation. The clothes represent the gift of salvation. And you can look at that all over the scriptures. Um, I was just reading yesterday that when Israel was about to meet with God and God would come as a cloud, God told Moses, tell all of Israel 
to prepare and wash their clothes. Though the clothing represents this preparation of meeting God, of actually being intact with God, having a proper heart posture towards God. And some of us and some people in the church are in there as if the church was a social club. It's a good place to feel hyped. It's a good place to belong to. It feels good, but there is no relationship. There is no faith in God. There is no understanding of who God really is. There is no understanding of doctrine. There's no understanding of what Jesus has truly done for you. There's no understanding of who you really are without Christ. And let me remind you that you are broken. You are sinful. We without God are nothing. And it's not until we come to the revelation of who God is and who we are that we will never be able to receive and embrace Jesus for who he truly is. So there are three groups of people that Jesus illustrates in this parable. Those that refuse God because they have too many excuses and they're too busy. Those that receive the invitation of the gospel and gladly partake into relationship with God. And those who receive the invitation but don't embrace Jesus for who he is fully. They're in the church, but they are not the church. And then Jesus finishes this parable with a shocking statement. I mean, you thought that that part was shocking. Listen to this next part. And he says this, for many are called, but few, few are chosen. And everybody's like, what the heck does that even mean? Like, oh my goodness, what is he trying to say? This is really tough. This is really hard. This is really shocking. This is not really like, you know, making me feel too good. And the truth is this, that it's important to note, it's very important to note, I, I, the reason why I believe Jesus taught, taught this is because it's important to note that God calls everyone to receive grace and salvation, but not everyone responds to the call. Not everybody receives the invitation. Only a few actually respond to the call. Second thing that is very important for us to understand that Jesus is teaching is that it's not a slight thing it's not a simple thing. It's not a light thing. It's not a slight thing to refuse the invitation to salvation because God will hold those who refuse his call responsible to their choice at the end of this life. And third, you can pay lip service to God's call without truly embracing Jesus. And with this too, God will hold you accountable. Very important lessons that Jesus is trying to teach through this parable. Very important lessons that you need to consider and think about. You need to have a heart check. We need to have a heart check. And there's a problem that I've noticed over this, these couple of past weeks. And the problem is that I've noticed that there is a decline in the global church when it comes to attending church and giving God our worship and making ourselves available, just like the song that we sang. There's a decline in the availability that we give to God to hear his word and to learn about him and to give ourselves an opportunity to connect with him. There's a decline. And it's interesting that the easier it gets to go to church, the more apathetic we grow as human beings. Before quarantine, we had to physically drive, get on the bus or walk, taxi or Uber or whatever to get to church. You had to do your makeup if you're a girl, do your hair, it involved work. Men, you have to shower and really like, you know, try to like get a nice outfit or whatever it is and step out of the house. It was a little bit more difficult, but you would do it. And then we got into quarantine, church became easier because all you had to do was grab your phone and click a notification. But the easier it's gotten, the more apathetic we're growing. And this is not correct. This is not right. Church online has become so accessible and it's so accessible that we push it off to the side because we can watch it later another day during the week. There are too many of you in here. There are too many of you in, in, in this moment where because you can watch church online on a Monday or a Tuesday or on a Wednesday, you go, eh, it's okay, I'm not going to tune in on a Sunday and you're forgetting the point. That the point is not just to do a religious good thing. The point is to have a principle of first, a principle of worship. That you've dedicated Sunday at 2 p.m. Because if you belong to Crave Church, Sunday at 2 p.m. or Sunday at 10 p.m. is the time that you've set for the Lord. 
It's not about giving God our crumbs and saying, well, you know, it's really nice outside. The sun is shining. I'm going to go to the beach and spend time with friends. I can watch church online later. What did you just do right there? You just casted Jesus to the side. He's no longer a priority. This is wrong. As your pastor, you need to listen to what I'm telling you. This attitude is wrong. And we're not saying that it's wrong because we want to be religious, but we want to teach our church worship. And worship says, hey, this day is dedicated to the Lord. This is the day that our church has dedicated. Thursday night is the day that we dedicate to pray as a church, and Sunday is the day that we dedicate to receive. With the midweek experience, we have two parts. The first half where we sing and receive a word, and the second half where we pray. It's so interesting how our numbers always decline in viewers for the second half when it comes to prayer. That's not right. That's not what God is looking for. And as your pastor, I need to call this out. And we need to correct this. We cannot brush church. On. This type of attitude comes from a heart that sees church online as a good thing to do. But it's not a God thing for them. They've missed the whole point. You've missed the whole point. And the whole point is worship. Sunday is the day that we've chosen to dedicate to the Lord. Not out of religiosity, but out of worship. It's a principle of first. We respect our jobs more than we respect God. I think that sometimes we prioritize a live boxing match on TV more than we would prioritize church online. And others of you are worshiping the weather more than you worship God. Because when it's raining, you can't make it to church. Bad weather. When the weather's good and it's sunny, it's like you can't make it to church because it's good weather and you got to enjoy it. My goodness, I wonder what would happen to you and your boss and the relationship between you and your company if that was the attitude you took towards your company, but you wouldn't dare, would you? We wouldn't. You know why? Because we consider it a priority in our life. We consider it something important in our life. I'm wondering, do you consider God less important? Do you not recall that because of God, you have that job? Don't you remember the days that you used to pray for the job, the promotion? And you said, God, I will serve you if you give me the job. And God gave it to you now? The job come f comes first? You, you, you worship the blessing and you don't worship the one who provided the blessing? I think that we have our priorities a little bit confused. And none of these things are bad. None of these things are bad. And I'm not saying that we can't miss church due to certain specific reasons. But sadly... There are many, there are many using anything as an excuse to not give God the time that he deserves. And the point of all this, the point of this is not for you to live in fear. Because this is exactly what these people in the first group were doing that Jesus spoke about. They were putting everything as an excuse. My business, the farm, I just don't want them as friends. I'm, so I'm going to insult them, mock the people that always talk to me about these things. Right? We are doing exactly what Jesus speaks about. The first group that he describes sounds a lot like a lot of us. Instead of having an incline and us reaching more souls like every servant of God should do and extend the invitation of salvation, we are becoming like the people in the first group of this parable. You're declining. This is not correct. And you got to really ask yourself which part which group out of the three you're standing in? Are you the first group who refuses God because you're too busy, too many excuses? Are you the second group where you gladly receive the invitation? Or are you the third group? You're in there, but you're not a part of us. You're not a part of the church. You're in the church, but you're not the church. Who are you? And I don't say all these things so that you can question yourself and live in fear and doubt, but I'm saying this so that you can examine yourself the Apostle Paul spoke about examining and testing your faith. He actually says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Test yourselves to make sure that you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Some of us take what we have for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence. Watch this. Not mere hearsay, not just words. That Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, then do something about it. So where do you stand in your faith? 
Where do you stand? Have you tested your faith? Are you fully in? Have you given yourself 100% to Jesus authentically, genuinely? What side of the line are you in? Which group do you stand in? My goal for you today is to really help you distinguish what side of the line you are on through a few questions. And so I want us to look at a few questions and they all start with C. So I think you're going to like this. Number one, do you live by convenience or do you live by conviction? Convenience or conviction? When you know that you need to repent, do you follow the conviction of the Holy Spirit or do you follow your convenience? When you know you need to repent, do you follow the conviction of the Holy Spirit or do you follow your convenience? Because conviction says you need to drop that thing. Conviction says you need to stop that thing. Conviction says that you need to get your life in order. You need to get your priorities in order. But then convenience says, convenience says, no, 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 no. You can't do that because it's going to hurt you. You can't do that. It's going to be different. You can't do that because that means that you need to trust and depend on God. And you can't depend on your wisdom. You can't depend on your ability, your gifting, your talent, your money. You can't depend on your connections. You can't depend on all your talent, your gifting, your ability. And so it becomes inconvenient to your ego to let go of your talent, your gifting, your ability, your money. What do you follow? Your conviction? Or do you live by convenience? When you have a conviction to dethrone an idol, do you say no because it's not convenient to do so? So when God is telling you to dethrone an idol, are you saying no? Because if I dethrone her, if I dethrone him, I'm going to feel lonely and that's not convenient to me. Do you say, no, I'm not going to let go of that, that job because then my identity will fall apart. And if I'm not a part of that job or I'm not a part of that group, if I'm not a part of this thing, then I have no one, then no one's going to respect me. It's not convenient to you. Do you reject and refuse God simply because it's not convenient to your lifestyle or do you follow your conviction? Some of you will not follow God because it's not convenient for your lifestyle. And you may be in the church, but following Jesus, genuinely, authentically following Jesus is not convenient to you. You like the feel good sermons. You like the, you like the goosebumps in worship. You, you, you like the sermons that hype you up, pump you up, that tell you that, yes, you can do it and that God is for you. But then when God sends a sermon or a word or an invitation and he brings a conviction, you no longer like it because it's no longer convenient to your lifestyle. So where do you stand? Conviction or convenience? Second, do you have carnal faith or do you have crazy faith? Crazy faith always persists. Crazy faith is constant. Crazy faith is consistent. It always believes in God and his word, and it always moves forward. But carnal faith, on the other hand, doesn't. Carnal faith always is in need of convincing. It complains about the process. It forgets how faithful God has been. It grumbles and it murmurs. Carnal faith is ungrateful. Crazy faith believes God no matter what it looks like. Crazy faith receives God's path, receives God's next step, even if it's something difficult. Crazy faith decides to worship God in sickness or in health, for better or for worse, in the good times and in the bad times. Crazy faith is, 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 is completely attached and anchored in trust, in trust, of the Lord, and it knows that God, God will make a way no matter what happens, but carnal faith complains all the time. Carnal faith is not persistent. Carnal faith always needs someone to pick you up. Carnal faith always needs convincing. It reminds me of the faith that the Israelites had after God delivered Israel out of slavery. With He showered them with gold. He showered them, man, he, they had bling, bro. God parted the sea for them. God led them through a pillar of fire during the night and a cloud during the day. Like if a cloud led you and or a pillar of fire was like driving in front of you at night, you, you know that nothing can stand in the way, bro. Like, dude, you, you, you're secure. You're confident. You know that God's real. But these people had all that. 
And they would always murmur. They would always complain. And they always needed Moses to preach a sermon to them to get back on track because they kept on forgetting God's faithfulness. See, that's carnal faith. Carnal faith forgets God. Carnal faith needs someone to convince you to stay. Carnal faith is complaining. It's always whining. Carnal faith always makes you the victim. Carnal faith always closes the eyes at faith. And there are too many of you that you're living through carnal faith. You need convincing all the time to do the right thing. You, you don't want to grow up and mature into crazy faith. You don't want to grow up. You want to stay a spiritual infant, always needing to drink milk and never having solid food. And that's not right. You got to examine yourself. Where are you? Are you carnal? Faith? Always needing to be picked up. Always needing a pick me up, pick me up, pick me up. Lift my hands. Carry me. You're not going to get to heaven by being carried, my brother, my sister. No one can hold you by the hand when it comes to salvation. Salvation is individual. And some of you are living by borrowed faith. My grandma's faith, my mom's faith, my dad's faith. And that, that is carnal. That is carnal. Israel constantly needed reminders of why they needed to follow God, of why they needed to worship God and serve him. Even though he had delivered them from their chains, they had carnal faith. They never grew up spiritually. Here's the next one. Are you contract or are you covenant? Are you contract or are you covenant? Covenant is loyal through the good and the bad. Contract is only loyal in the good. I'm going to say this one more time for you, okay? Covenant is loyal to God in the good and in the bad. A contractual relationship, though, is only loyal in the good times when it's convenient to you. It's funny how we expect and we demand covenant from God, but we only give him contract in return. We want God to bless us. We want God to heal us. We want God to deliver us. We want God to anoint us. We want God to use us. We want God to provide for us. And we want provision, blessing, anointing, help, healing, deliverance. And then when he says, hey, give me your Sunday at 2 p.m., we say, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll watch you on Monday. If you married you, how long would you last with you with that type of heart, posture, or attitude? This is why I really wanted to address this. Because I don't want to build disciples and followers of Jesus that think they are following Jesus, but they're not. Sure, the weather is nice, the long weekend's here. But goodness sakes, you have 24 hours in one day. You can't give God 53 minutes. That's how long our experience was last week. 53 minutes. And join with your brothers and sisters in the church. Watch and pray and worship together and receive the word of God together. That to me is incorrect. That to me is not right. It's funny. We demand covenant from God, but we give him contract in return. And let me prove it to you. How often do we approach God to just worship him, to admire him, to entertain his presence, and to just love him in comparison to asking him to bless us, protect us, anoint us, etc. Contrast the two. What's your approach to God most of the time? Is it to bless him, to love him, or is it to ask for blessing and to ask for love? Nothing wrong with asking Jesus wants us to ask him, but the truth is this. Most of us have a transactional relationship with God. If you bless me, then I will. It's no longer worship. We have a transactional relationship with God. It's transactional. If you pay me, then I'll do the favor. If you bless me, then I will show up to church online. If you promote me at my workplace, then I'll give you my money. Transactional. It's no longer covenant. It's contract. And then, are you called or are you chosen? 
Now, Jesus made this distinction between two. Many are called, but very few are chosen. And what separates these two categories is the posture of your heart. So how are you responding to God in your heart during this season? In your life, how have you been responding to God? I want to read some passages that show you something where God is really looking for heart. John 4, 23 says this, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now, actually, he says, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. Watch this. The Father is looking. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. And then 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, for the eyes of the Lord search back and forth across the whole earth, looking for people whose hearts are fully committed toward him so that he can show his great power in helping them. Let me ask you a question. What is God finding when he looks at your heart? What does God come across with when he looks at your heart? What's in your heart? Are you fully committed? Not by words. Don't say, yes, yes, I am. Think about it. Think about it for a few minutes. Are you fully committed to him? Or are you fully committed to a church? Are you fully committed to a ministry? Are you fully committed to a group of people that you like because they're called Crave Church and they're cool? Who are you committed fully to? Is it Christ? Is it, is, is it, is it a group of people? Is it a brand? When God looks at your heart and he searches to and fro and he sees you, what is he finding in your heart? Are you chosen? Or are you called? Many are called. The call is for everybody, but not everybody answers the call. And being in the church does not mean that you answered the call. It's your heart's posture. That is what we're seeing here. Have you given yourself generally to God? Have you given yourself completely to God? And here's the last question. Are you a crowd or are you church? Are you crowd or church? Which one are you? Through this pandemic, we can truly see who we really are. Are we a church or have we simply just been a crowd who met for hype and good feelings? Good vibes. This pandemic is showing us who we truly are. Were you only committed when you got to feel good at church live? In person at a physical location? Or your physical location if you were going to another church or somewhere around the world? Or are you actually committed during the physical location and this quarantine time? Because the easier it's got into attend church, the more apathetic we've become, the more the, the, the lazier and the more slumber we allow to influence our decisions. And we live disordered lives where we've really flipped everything upside down. I mean, some of you, some of us go to sleep around really late. I'm not going to say any times. But we go to sleep really late. We've completely, completely disordered our living. And that disorder has slipped into our spiritual life. Where I got to sleep. I'm not going to make it to church anymore. But it's like 2 p.m., bro. Yes. Yes. That, that needs to stop. That, need, that needs to change. This pandemic is showing us who we truly are. Are we a church or have we just simply been meeting for hype and good feels and good vibes? A crowd is dismantled when a tragedy strikes, but the church, on the other hand, becomes stronger. The church becomes stronger when a tragedy strikes. The church is different from a crowd. The church is persistent. The church has crazy faith. A crowd has carnal faith. A church, a true church, the church, the spiritual entity that really loves Jesus, gives themselves away, is covenant. A crowd is contract. There's a difference. A church is chosen. A crowd is called. During this time, we need to know what side of the line we stand in. Are we just a crowd or are we a church? Because a church will remain consistent. A church won't need reminders. Hey, don't forget to tune into church online. Hey, don't forget to pray. Hey, don't forget. A church does not need that. A church is a body. You don't tell people to live. People that are alive just live. 
you don't need to remind me to breathe. And I definitely don't need to remind you to breathe. You just do it because you're alive. The church doesn't need reminders to seek God and to prioritize them. They just do because it's who they are. A crowd, on the other hand, a crowd needs reminders and they are not consistent during pandemic. They fluctuate. They need reminders. They need reconvincing. They need someone to pull them and be like, come on, Timmy, just like a lot of women have to do with their boy husbands. We really, come on, you got to get to work, pick up your clothes. And God's not looking for a child. God is looking for a bride. God wants you to be mature. And he speaks something in Revelations chapter 2. And he says, and this is a letter to the church. He says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This was the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. So the gold lampstands represent churches. Every church is a lampstand. And then he says this to the lampstand of Ephesus or the church of Ephesus. I know all the things that you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. That's really good stuff. He's complimenting them. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me. You don't love me. You stopped prioritizing me. You're dutiful, but you're distracted. And then he adds this, you don't love me or each other. And you don't love people either, as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me to do the works that you did at first. Come back to your first love like you used to love me before. And if you don't repent, then I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. I'm going to read this to you. The church of Ephesus was dutiful, but it was distracted. And God compliments them on the things that they were doing right. But he had one thing against them. They didn't love him the same way they used to love him at first. They were a crowd meeting under Jesus' name, but they weren't the church that loved Jesus. And God is saying that if you don't repent... I'm going to remove your lampstand. And what does that mean? Well, the thing is that Jesus sees a church like a lampstand. He sees the church as a light post from heaven in a dark world. And so what happens when we lose our lampstand? People in darkness can no longer find us. But when we're passionate about Jesus and he is first and we prioritize him, God will supernaturally illuminate our church in a dark world so that people in darkness can see us. A crowd, on the other hand, loves convenience, it loves contract, it loves carnal faith, and it places all these things over Jesus. And when a church becomes a crowd, God will not assist it because lukewarm Christians are a bad advertisement for a great God. God can't bring lost people to a crowd with idols inside their hearts. God can only bring people to a church that places God first because the church that loves Jesus is a lampstand that leads people in darkness to Christ. And some of you have fallen far because Jesus isn't first in your life anymore. He's not in the same place that he was when you first started. And he isn't first because you have an idol inside your heart. We need to turn back to Jesus because there are many people that need to be saved. You have family in your living room that need salvation. Your friends at work that you truly, dearly love that need salvation. But God can't use a crowd with idols in our heart. And when we don't put Jesus first, he removes the lampstand. You know what the success of a church is? The success of a church is found in how passionate the church is for Jesus. 
The success is not found in how great the numbers are. The numbers will come because the harvest belongs to him, but he can't give his harvest to a crowd with idols. These questions are serious questions that will test your faith. And all these questions are reflected in the three categories of people. So where do you stand today? A church cares about people. A crowd doesn't. So are you church? Are you crowd? Because I care about people. And I want God to send a harvest. So that more people could be enlightened and saved and receive grace. Because I'm a messenger. I'm a servant of a king. And you, you are a servant of a king too. That needs to be sent to the circle of influence that I can't influence, but you can. You have family that needs to be saved. But you need to be church. You can't just be a crowd. That just removes God and throws him to the side like a whatever thing. And I'll just watch church online on Monday. God rebuke that in the name of Jesus Christ. May God correct that inside your heart. God comes first. He is our priority. We love him and we love people. We need to return to loving Jesus and to loving people. Because when we love Jesus and we place him first, he can send a harvest to be saved and our church becomes a lampstand for people in darkness to see. I want to read you a letter that I received last week. Two weeks ago, sorry. Do you guys remember the documentary that we had? The documentary that we made about that moment where forgiveness had to be a thing? Well, that documentary and that sermon were really powerful. And for the glory of, and to the glory of God, by the grace of God, God allowed me to be used by him, to be a light, and to speak his word, which is a lamp onto our feet, so that people could be illuminated and forgive. And I want to give you, I want to give you a letter that I received from someone. And this was in response to the message of unforgiveness on our worship series, week three, I believe it was. It says this, hey, Pastor Marlon, I hope that you're doing well right now during this quarantine time. I wanted to tell you how impactful today's experience was for me. To be honest, I wasn't expecting this week to be one of my favorites, but it turned out to be my favorite so far of the series. Probably my favorite one since church moved online and possibly one of the best ones I've heard from you guys since I've been in Crave. The reason why today's experience was so powerful for me was because two years ago, my parents got divorced after being together for 20 years. Now, some people might think, oh, it's been two years already. Shouldn't you be over it by now? But in reality, it's not that simple. I'm 20 right now, but at the time of the divorce, I was 18. For 18 years of my entire life, I had that sense of security that my family was going to be together forever. Yes, my parents fought from time to time, as I'm sure all couples do after being together for a long time, but I never expected one of their fights to end up splitting the family apart. When the fights that led to the divorce started to begin, I didn't take them seriously because I was used to my parents fighting. I just thought, oh, it's one of their fights again. They'll be angry at each other for a few days and then they'll make up and everything will go back to normal. It never did go back to normal though. Day after day, it started to get worse and worse, and it started to seem like there was no end to it. I started to fall into a deep depression because I was worried that my parents were going to split up. But not only that, I was angry that this was all happening. I tried to never be at home because every time I set foot in the house, I would get angry, and I wouldn't be able to think straight. Really, though, I wasn't able to think straight at all. I ended up getting into a serious car accident one day because I was thinking about it so much. I won't go into the details about my, why my parents got divorced, but the gist of it was that my dad had um, beat my mom multiple times throughout the relationship and eventually he ended up cheating on her. This broke my mom and it broke me too. Finding out that the person that raised me was doing these things made me fall into despair and I felt disgusted. I couldn't look or think about my dad without getting angry at him for what he had done to my mother and to the family. Eventually, my parents did go through with a divorce and it left me to be the man of the house and in charge of being a father figure to my younger brother. I hated what had happened to me 
but I felt even worse for what had happened to my younger brother. I'm a few years older than him, so in theory, I feel I was better able to handle a situation like this, but I can't imagine what my brother has to go through with this happening during his prime life-shaping years. I hated my dad for a really, really long time, and up to now, I still carried a grudge against him and what, had, and what he had done. Even though I've had two years to deal with this situation and to eventually forgive my dad, I've never been able to fully forgive him. I've been able to forgive him through words, but I haven't been able to fully forgive him through my heart. When I was watching the experience today with my mom beside me, I could feel right from the beginning of worship that today's experience was going to be powerful. I sang out loud with my mom throughout the worship, and I really felt the Holy Spirit was there in me and in my mom preparing me for what was about to be spoken. After the documentary, the mood was set and the spirit of forgiveness was looming over us. Throughout the sermon that you were preaching, I was picturing my dad and I was starting to forgive him for everything that he had done. Everything that he had done to me, to my brother, to my mom, and to our family. And as I was forgiving him inside my heart, I felt the urge to cry. And I was fighting that urge because I knew that if I started crying, that I would make my mom cry. And I've seen her cry so many times that I didn't want to see, I didn't want to make that happen again. By the time that you were praying the last prayer before Church Online ended though, I couldn't hold back the tears any longer. I fought so hard against it, but my body gave in and the tears started to pour out. I looked up at my mom and she was crying too. I knew that we were both feeling the same emotions for, of forgiving my dad. It was unreal. I felt like a weight that I've been carrying for so long has finally been lifted off of me. I feel like I'm finally able to breathe and forgive fully. It's hard to explain what I'm feeling in words, but just know that it's powerful. So I'm just gonna end things off by saying thank you. I know I poured out a lot of myself in the story, so thank you for taking the time out of your day to read all of, all of this and for being such a great pastor. I will forever be grateful for the change that you've sparked in me and my family. Words won't be able to express the level of gratitude that I have. Thank you, Pastor Marlon. I love you and I'm praying for you. God bless you. This is a result of what it means to be a church and not a crowd. Real life change. Real impact. But we can't do these types of things. We can't be a lampstand if we don't place Jesus first. Because Jesus will remove, God will remove the lampstand. Some of you need to repent. Because the same impact that I've made through preaching here is the same impact that you can make out there. And together we can make a greater impact. And so I leave this with you. I want you to come back to God and change this attitude that we've had of leaving God as last. He should be first. Your job is no reason to miss church. Nuh-uh. And you have options. Everybody has options. You can speak to managers. I remember my mom taught us, me and my sister, she taught us to prioritize God and the church from an early age. And some of you might say, well, God and the church are not the same thing. Like, I don't need to be at church in order to show that I worship God. Yes, you do. Do not forget that the church is the body of Christ. How you treat the church is an indicative of how you treat God or treat Jesus. So my mom always, from a young age, taught us. And I remember my sister got her first summer job. And my mom told my sister, do not take any shifts on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. Because if you do, I'm going to go pick you up. And you're not going to be able to work your shift. And you're going to be held responsible. So if your bosses get mad, it's on you. Because you're going to make it to church. And my sister was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember that. My sister didn't listen to that. This is a story we talk about and laugh about all the time now. And she took a shift on a Wednesday when we were supposed to go to midweek. And my mom, you know, is at work. And she goes, hey, are you heading to church? And my sister was like, uh, I, I, I kind of got uh, uh, a shift today because it's only for today because I'm going to get trained today. And my mom's like, 
you let go of the shift right now. And she's like, I have to, I have to, because I need to get trained. And my mom's like, you have to let go of that shift today because you need to be at church. And she said, mom, just for today. And my mom's like, I'm going to give you three seconds. And if you, if I don't hear you talking to your boss right now, I'm going to leave my workplace right now and I'm going to walk to yours and I'm going to go take you by the ear in Jesus's name and drag you to church. And of course, as children, we complained during those moments. But now as a 30-year-old man, I look back to that and I said, that was a principle. That was a principle of priority and of worship to me. That she was teaching to us. You want to know why? Because there will always be important reasons that are only going to be one time to keep you from God. And if you don't start developing that muscle now, you will do it later. It's exactly how people say, when I get a lot of finances, then I will start giving. No, if you can't give with 10 bucks, you won't give with 100. And if you don't give when you have 100, you will not give when you get 1,000. It's a principle of priority and of worship. Because we need to come back to loving God and loving people. And so, when you love God, prioritize Him. And when you love people, prioritize Him too. Here's what I want you to do this week. I want us to have something called Family Night this week. And it's a challenge for all viewers. I want us to have a family night. And what I want you to do is I want you to serve your family this week. Pick one day out of the week where you're going to serve your family. Cook dinner for them or order gourmet food. Please do not order ramen or microwave it. Make a nice gesture. Something fancy, something wonderful, something gourmet, something that will taste good. And I want you to host your family. Make it a night where you want to offer them something special. A meal where you all sit together and talk and then after your meal, what I want you to do is, I want you to take week three's experience, which is the documentary and the sermon on forgiveness. And I want you to play it for your family and you all watch it together to start a conversation in case there needs to be forgiveness involved. And forgiveness allows that topic is pretty much the central topic of the gospel. Jesus forgives us of our sins. So you're gonna do two things. You're killing two birds with one stone. You're going to create an atmosphere where you and your family can open up if there's been past hurts and give an opportunity for forgiveness. And it's a form to extend the gospel to your family as well. Now, if all of your family is good and you're all saved and you are all watching church online together right now, invite a family friend or a fam an extended family member considering COVID-19 if everybody's okay with it. You invite one person that you host them with your entire family. Your entire family hosts this family member, this extended family member. So we can love on people and reach out for people. Because COVID-19 is not going to be a pandemic where Crave Church declines. COVID-19 is going to be a pandemic where the church inclines. It's going to grow. It's going to increase, not decrease. Remember, we are a church, not a crowd. Because we prioritize God and we prioritize people. Let's close our eyes and let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time that you've given us together. We bless your holy name, Lord God. I have confidence that your word today spoke to our spirit. I pray in the name of Jesus, break through, Lord God, all the busyness, all the obstacles, all the barriers, all the distractions. And I pray for a spirit of repentance where we may come back to you, where we, we may repent, Lord God, and turn back to our first love. May we love you the same way we did when we first began. And I pray for people that are receiving the invitation right now to have an open heart to say yes to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've never received Christ, I want to offer you an invitation today to allow Jesus to be your Lord and Savior right now. Maybe you've heard about it and you've rejected it, but now you've come to a place in your life where it's been tough and your heart has been softened maybe through hard moments. Or maybe you've never been through difficult, difficult moments, but you're hearing this and you need a savior. Because at the end of this life, our soul still lives on. And there are too many of you that you're walking without the savior of your soul. There are too many of you that are walking without the savior of your soul. So you need to allow Jesus to come into your heart. So if this is you, whichever case you're in, I'm a servant today of a king inviting you to a banquet, 
This banquet's called the table of grace. And salvation is available for you today. And so if this is you, I want you to repeat this prayer as a conversation to God, not as a religious thing to do, a conversation where you open up to him. So I want you to, if you need to close your eyes and picture him, you talking to him. And if you don't want to close your eyes, as a matter of fact, don't even close your eyes if you don't feel like closing your eyes. Just look up at him if you need to, as a symbolism of you talking to him, okay? So I'm going to lead you into prayer. You're going to repeat what you need to tell him, but I want you to repeat it with meaning. Here we go. Say this with me if this is you today that wants to receive the invitation. Father in heaven, I pray forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me for rejecting you and refusing you. Today, I receive you and I receive the invitation of grace, of salvation. I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you so much. I am so proud of you if you've made this decision. And this is the end of the message today. I pray that all of you as Crave Church, that you consider these words. That you may make the change and repent. Let us not brush God off the way that we've been doing. We should not decrease. We should increase. Amen. I love you so much. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. I will see you again next week. And don't forget to catch my birthday special. It's nasty. God bless you. Love you.